One, two, one, two, three. Testing. So the Higgs boson walks into a Catholic church. And the priest says, I'm sorry, we don't allow bosons in church. And the Higgs says, well, but you can't have mass without me. <laughs> <laughs> Good one. So it's time to start, I think. I'll try not to overrun. So, uh, shall we start? I think most of us are here. So, um, I've got some feedback on the solution that I provided, uh, and uh, I've improved it a little bit. So, um, what I wanted, I wanted the pack functionality to be in a separate function, uh, for the reasons that become clear later. So, um, and also the key is obviously already readily available. So, I passed it to pack function, and. Uh, um, Group is actually a generator. So, um, does anyone know what's the complexity of LAN operation on a generator? Okay, so in that case, um, uh, whether you convert it to list outside of pack or inside, it's a question of clarity rather than efficiency. So, that's the solution I wanted. So, the next uh, is the same in Haskell. So, in this case, um, have I spoken about this? Or mm, probably not. So this is the Haskell solution for the same problem. Um, we have two functions, a pack function and encode function. Encode function is very similar to what you've seen before when we flattened the list. So it, it groups the elements, then uh, it uh, pipes it to function, which was made uh, by carrying the first argument of map with a pack function, and pack function is basically a function that takes a list of uh, elements of type A and returns a tuple of length 2, and uh, uh, since um, we want our lists to be polymorphic, we don't actually specify what type of A is until this point here, where we force it to be um, uh, a member of the um, equality type class. That's the only constraint, because we need to compare for equality uh, for the purposes of uh, invoking group. So um, that's the Haskell solution. And uh, now the exercise is to modify the previous solution a little bit so that um, this is not particularly great compression um, when we have uh, one element and uh, we convert it into a tuple of lengths two. So we want now an inhomogeneous list where if uh, an element is repeated once, it's just copied as is. And uh, if element is repeated more than uh, once, then we want a tuple. I already did this one. Okay, so uh, uh, work on whatever you, you've forgotten. So what is, that is run length encoding two, or one, I think. Uh, uh, one of the two, so it, it should have this set of tests. I think the test for the second one is the same, but with a verbal constraint, so you can use either. It should be on the in the solutions folder. 
Okay. Oh, maybe number three? Yeah. That's a destructive, non recursive. Yeah. I, I haven't tested it. If, if not, the pitch is welcome. <laughs> so I need to... I'm confused now. Yeah. <laughs> that was funny. That was actually something else. Damn. Uh, it's going to be a bit messy doing this way. Okay. Oh, yeah, I should say. Oops. Mm. Sorry. So list. So uh, we're probably done with this. Um, here's the solution I came up with, which can be uh, refactored to so pack function has the same interface, but basically I just have an if statement that checks if it's a, um, a list, a sublist of lengths one. In that case, I just return an element. And um, the encode function is the same. So the Haskell version, now that we've come up with in in homogeneous lists, um, it is uh, um, slightly more involved. We have to define a list item again, and uh, we define it to have two constructors, a single a and multiple int a, where the first um, argument is of type int and it uh, represents the multiplicity and second one is the element itself 
and uh, I realized pack uh, as an if statement. So if I check if it's a blank one, then I return single, um, and I pass value. And uh, if otherwise, it's a multiple MV. And this is a neat way of uh, defining local variables in uh, Haskell in, in within that if statement. So I type where. Uh, I had to put it on one line to make sure it fits on the slide, but you don't have to for clarity. Usually, I'll line them here. And uh, encode function did not change uh, a bit. So, say it again. Uh, they are constructors. So you, uh, they, they, these are constructors. You can create an um, uh, item of type list A the following way. You can write single and that item, or you can multiple, and then you have to provide multiplicity and the element. Yeah, this is, this is a way to have a uh, uh, user-defined data types in Haskell. Yeah, so I want the data types, I was just wondering where, because I don't see the definition for single there, so I was wondering where it appeared Oh, it's here. Uh, this, the, all of this, this one liner is a definition. Yeah. It's a definition. So uh, to read it, you read it that the, um, everything on the right is the constructors, and on the left is the type. Yeah? So the Python for the previous exercise. Yeah. Yeah, I just I chose, um, I have this extra constraint. Uh, I, I keep them in sync, the Haskell and Python solutions, so it's easier to read. So there is less. Uh, uh, well, um, the really functional, functional way, I'd say, is to use recursion here, but uh, we'll get to that in a second. Yeah, just a second. Yeah, uh, so the, in that case, we can have it as a um, uh, generator s uh, expression. Yeah. Yeah, cool. So. Um, mm, there is slight difference there. Mm, they, the yield is slightly faster. I think I mentioned it before. Yeah. So there's a Haskell solution. Please uh, have a prod when you have time. And um, the next exercise has the same um, set of constraints in terms of asserts, but there is a verbal constraint. What we've been doing before, we've been taking a list which was uh, taking memory of order n, and then we were uh, creating another data structure that contained sublists. And what, what this effectively meant, we've created a copy of it, only differently structured. So at one point in the execution time, there was the whole thing uh, copied in memory. So what we want to do now is to deflate on the fly, so walk through the list and uh, um, pack it without this extra overhead in terms of memory. Um, well, uh, what group by returns, it returns, so here, uh, what group by returns, it returns uh, a generator that will keep producing uh, tuples of key group, where key is the scalar and uh, group is a generator itself. But then, to work out the length, we have to compute the length of it, and the, we create a copy of it. Okay. So... Um, what I want you to do, I want to restate the same solution in such a way so that it doesn't have an extra copy of sublists in. Yeah. Yeah, whichever you prefer. I would like to write it as an assert, but I couldn't. I didn't have time. <laughs> so. Yeah, uh, I guess not. Feel free to write uh, a version that destructs if you if you fancy. So 
So the difference is that I don't want to create sublists. I want to have uh, the true run links encoding where you run through the list uh, element by element and encode it on the fly. Yeah, if you will, you can try and avoid using group by. I guess what um, what we are unsure here is the internals of how group by operates, right? So, because uh, does group by actually, uh, if you um, try to compute the length of the generator that is returns as a second element of the tuple, does it actually uh, um, inflate it in RAM? I suspect it does. Um, the way we mm. so, but what I what I don't want, I don't want sublist in memory. Yep. Well, you can you can use the original list, right? The original list is always available, so you can just walk through it, right? Can I look over your shoulder? Yeah, yeah. Getting bored. New York. If you know there are some spaces over there, there's a table, I think.
Никого справа. Просыпается нормально. So, so uh, has anyone solved this? Almost. So three people, four people have done. So uh, I guess we should move on for a bit and then uh, uh, I don't think if I show the solution, it will change much uh, um, the way you think about it, because you'll have to write it anyway by yourself. So um, this, is, this is a solution as well. So it's, that's what I came up with. Uh, it's a bit more complex than uh, um, the previous solution. So I defined again a peg function, which behaves similarly. And uh, there is some logic that uh, uh, goes as follows. So if uh, the length, uh, length of the list is less than uh, 2, then I just return the list. Um, otherwise, um, I uh, create these uh, uh, state variables, multiplicity and value, and initialize them. And uh, the result will be returned as m uh, list. And uh, then I iterate over the constituents of L. Uh, starting from the, f the second element onwards, and then if uh, the element is the same as a uh, uh, memoized element, I'll uh, simply increment multiplicity. Otherwise, I append a pack um, of uh, multiplicity value to the resulting list, and then uh, there has to be one more pack statement. Uh, if you consider this carefully in the end, and then I return the list. So uh, um, it's it, it's quite. Uh, a lot longer than I would like, but so the um, the equivalent solution in Haskell. Again, we use this. We reuse the uh, previous um, user-defined data structure that uh, I've showed earlier, but it didn't fit on the screen this time, which is which is not really fair to Haskell because uh, you can actually omit the uh, type signatures of those functions, but I, I put them here anyway. You you remember the. Uh, the definition for the uh, single and multiple. And so these are just two helper functions. So um, the pack function, uh, again, using pattern matching, if the first argument matches one, you just return single x. Otherwise, you uh, return multiple and x. And uh, 
this function takes care of an empty list and also it unpacks uh, whatever we've passed in into X and XS and uh, invokes this auxiliary walk function. And walk function is a little bit more involved. So uh, what I do, uh, the first argument is a multiplicity. I named it M here. Sorry, N, but uh, it was M in the other examples. So multiplicity, then the actual element, and this is the accumulator that I keep passing around. So if the x uh, equals, sorry, uh, the first uh, line takes care of an empty list. So if uh, uh, we've uh, uh, exhausted the uh, uh, list that we've passed in, we just uh, return a list of uh, uh, the final element packed. Otherwise, um, this constructor matches, um, sorry, this uh, pattern matches all the other cases where we unpack the, the list into Y and uh, the remainder um, of um, that list and um, it's available as YS later. And then we test for equality if X, which is the current element, and N is current multiplicity, if X equals the head of the um, re whatever is left to process. We just increment the multiplicity and invoke walk again. Otherwise, we uh, invoke walk again um, prepending to the result of walk, uh, starting with multiplicity 1 and uh, uh, unpicking uh, this into Y and YS here. Uh, we prepend, this is a, a prepend operator, um, the, uh, what is now a full uh, tuple pack NX. So that's the Haskell solution. Um, Uh, penultimate exercise is the sorting a list by sublist length. It, it was uh, quite easy. It's just a wine liner. So uh, I'll just show it. So we uh, uh, pass the uh, length function as a key to sort it. And um, all the assertions are satisfied. So it's a, it's a sorting function on the length of the list. And uh, what I'd like to show now is Haskell version of this. It's a very similar wine liner. You, you need to import some more stuff because it's not in Prelude, which is what the collection of functions available uh, straight away. So, but you import sort by and uh, you import from data or uh, comparing function and then you essentially define sort as the uh, sort by comparing length. And uh, um, that's the Haskell solution. So uh, a more interesting Python task is to sort list by sublist length frequency. So what this means is uh, I need to somehow work out what are the most frequent uh, lists by length and then use this information to sort the sublists. So you can find it, I think, in the uh, sort list by frequency problem.py in the directory. And uh, basically, these are the tests that it should satisfy. I hope they're exhaustive this time. So what it does, it, it's a list of uh, sublists. And uh, it sorts that list by the length of the, uh, uh, um, um, by the f uh, frequency of the length of those sublists. So for example, uh, take this case where the uh, uh, list sublist of length one is more frequent than uh, sublist of length two, so it puts them um, the rarest lists by length first, and then it puts the um, puts the more frequent ones. So if if you can uh, leverage this solution by uh, writing a a new key function. Or uh, perhaps if there is an easier way, you can try that as well.
sorry. Oh, I can provide you. Is it? Stop iteration, but that's only um, if you are defining it as an object. Uh, but you should really use the generators as uh, as a mechanism because it will do it for you with a lot less boilerplate. Well, once once uh, you exit from the generator function, yep. it, the exception will be automatically erased for you. Yeah. So when, when, yeah, when the, yeah. Cool. For the cur current exercise. So, how many people solved this one? Uh, all right, so we, we should be moving on. Um, so, this is a solution I came up with, which might not be an optimal, but basically. 
So um, what I'm doing here, I am uh, using a, a dictionary to um, store all possible lengths and the um, multiplicities. And then uh, I define this frequency function that will return... Pardon? Counter. Okay, so um, please send me a copy of your solution. I'll, I'll review mine. So, but what it does, it essentially uh, provides a get frequency function L, which is a function that returns a function that will uh, sort the list. So, uh, an equivalent solution um, in Haskell, I couldn't really obtain. But I obtained a slightly different one. So, what I'm doing here, um, I'm sorting list by comparing get frequency L will return a function that will re uh, sort. So it's 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 one to one correspondence between sort and frequency, Haskell to Python. So frequency, what it'll do, it'll uh, take a uh, it takes, um, so I've defined a couple of types, so it's easier to read, but you don't have to, you can just put them in place. But uh, I've defined uh, length and frequency as uh, new types. And uh, so frequency function, it takes a map now, uh, which is a data structure um, that uh, is implemented underneath as a tree. And uh, what it does, it returns, so this is the uh, indexing operator into a map. So map. Um, you index into map using this key, which is the length of L, and uh, it will provide in the end the value, which is the uh, frequency of L. And that will be the, the key on which you will sort. The function get frequency is a little bit more involved. What it does, first of all, it uh, creates a list of uh, um, lengths of all the sublists in that list. And then it uh, uses a sort function, which I imported from uh, data list, and uh, I did a qualified import. You can see it's, it's off the screen, actually, but it's a qualified import. So sort will sort them by um, uh, in ascending order, and uh, the map data structure, it has this uh, uh, order of uh, n in complexity method of constructing a map from a list of elements that are ascending. So I, I construct the histogram the same way, just uh, the histogram is now is represented as a tree rather than a dictionary. And uh, what I do next, I am um, uh, the actual body of this function is uh, I want to return a function that uh, will, if uh, piped two arguments into it, will return a comparison. So. Uh, what this does, it invokes frequency with the histogram that we just built. Uh, and that's all it does. So uh, there is also this pairs function, which uh, um, uh, to build a map from ascending list. Uh, map is uh, a data structure that holds keys and values. So um, um, for this purpose, I have created a, a lambda function. This is a way to define a lambda function in Haskell. Um, um, this, if, if you stretch it a little backslash loops like a part of a lambda, <laughs> so then um, uh, it'll return a tuple containing the length and uh, um, the multiplicity of that element. So all in all, it's the same, but uh, there is a little difference which I would like to discuss first. So uh, Python dictionaries are uh, hash tables as uh, uh, some of you might know, and uh, hash tables are implemented underneath uh, as arrays of key value pairs. And uh, uh, there is some heuristics uh, uh, of mapping key to an array index that is happening every time you index into a dictionary, and which goes like so you compute a, for example, if, a hash, if, it, if your keys are strings, there is a hash function that um, gets calculated, and um, if you try it yourself on 32-bit platform, you'll get uh, uh, the following hash for A. And then what happens, uh, there is some predefined array size, which get uh, uh, converted into the index by using array size. And then you use that index to actually look for the key value pair in the array. So if uh, the 
um, you have a collision, what happens there is, uh, is this extra perturbation mechanism that uh, looks for alternatives, uh, the logic of which I, I don't describe here, but it's, uh, you can look it up. And uh, you keep doing these perturbations until you find a slot that is free and uh, you populate it. And then if you, uh, uh, there is a, a bit more heuristics where if the array gets full and if um, the capacity is now over two thirds, it gets uh, resized at that point. And um, when you delete elements, uh, because of the perturbation mechanism, you actually don't actually remove them, uh, you just mark them as dummies. So that's the basics of uh, the implementation of Python dictionaries. And uh, what we get as a result is the um, order of um, constant uh, uh, insertion and lookup and uh, order of end construction. So it's a very fast data structure. Um, whereas That's, uh, that's the beauty of hash tables. They're very, very fast. They draw back, they are mutable. But yeah, well, it's a constant time. No, they, they're super fast. So uh, it, I, I'd like to stress it again. Uh, the uh, Python dictionaries, insertion and lookup are constant, constant time operations. That's why we love dictionaries, and that's why dictionaries are implemented this way, not some other way. Yeah, but that's the, the heuristics behind the resizing. What it does, it uh, makes sure the load factor of this um, hash table is low so that you don't have very many collisions. So what I'd like to contrast now is the, uh, this Haskell solution versus uh, Python solution, because we've seen we solved the previous problem using a dictionary in Python, and uh, uh, I chose to implement it as a tree in Haskell. So uh, uh, self-balancing trees, they... Um, um, access and insertion uh, is an operation um, of complexity order of log n, where n is the number of elements in the in data structure, and construction is n log n. Whereas in hash tables, it's uh, amortized order of one. Uh, you can have order of n worst case access and insertion, but amortized is constant. And uh, construction is cheaper as well, asymptotically. So what, um, what this actually mean that uh, the, um, um, potentially the uh, tree data structures, they require more reads, more rem reads, and rem reads are slow. So you, you incur penalty there. Trees, on the other hand, they are, if you want strong guarantees on how much it will take to look up an individual uh, key value pair, then trees are preferred because uh, no matter what key value pair you look up, it will always take a log n time, whereas, um, sorry, in, in, if you insert, it will always take log n time, whereas in hash tables it can take order of n time. So you, you, keep, you keep putting st stuff into your hash table and it will be really, really fast, but occasionally it will just take a really long time. Whereas um, balance trees guarantee this uh, uh, asymptotic complexity, but it's slower. Also, the additional benefit of trees is that if you need this extra property that keys are sorted, which would trees provide by default, then you're better off using balanced trees. And obviously trees need more RAM, because if you have an array, it's just the values, key value pairs, whereas a uh, tree, it's usually a node that contains the value, uh, and also you have pointers to branches. So um, it's an interesting difference there. So hash tables versus trees. Trees um, have another um, advantage that they can be recast in purely functional form. So uh, you can write trees as uh, uh, persistent data structures, and that's why Haskell um, community uh, uses them a lot. So uh, trees also require total order relationship, because if, if, you, if all you have is an identity operation, so you can compare the elements for equality but not sort them, then uh, trees are no good. Also, you need to consider a good hashing function, um, a fast one, and uh, it usually helps if you know a priori uh, what is going to be the number of elements. If you don't know, uh, then um, hash tables are probably better. And complexity, hash function evaluation versus comparison operation, some hash functions are really um, uh, hard to evaluate. We, we have um, string hash functions and integer hash functions uh, that are quite fast. 
So that's a, a quote from the book uh, Real World Haskell in, in map section, which uh, I'd like to, uh, I, I couldn't summarize it better myself, uh, uh, or rather restate it shorter. Uh, so um, I'll just read it out. So um, internally map is implemented as binary uh, balance tree. And uh, compared to hash tables, this is much more efficient representation in a language with immutable data. So if, if you omit that context immutable data, then it's not. But with immutable data, it's the most efficient one. And this is the most visible example of how deeply pure functional programming affects how we write code. We choose data structures and algorithms that we can express cleanly and that perform efficiently, but our choices for specific tasks are often different from their counterparts in imperative languages. So, and uh, there was this uh, uh, big uh, war online about uh, hash tables and Haskell. So I, I decided to venture and investigate it myself to see uh, uh, for myself what, uh, what's true, what isn't. So hash tables are a mutable data structure. And uh, therefore, mutable data structures is not what Haskell specializes in. And uh, uh, a priori C-like performance should not be expected if you implement a hash table in, in Haskell, even for very heavily optimized code. And worse still, uh, since uh, Hustlers do not choose to use hash tables, they, that, that part of the uh, uh, code base don't get a lot of attention in optimizations. So even though they can be faster, uh, the uh, current performance of them might be slower than what could uh, theoretically be achieved. And uh, the, this is the benchmark that I, uh, uh, that's created Don Stewart and Norman Ramsey. So what they did, they, they put up a, a, a tiny benchmark where you push on a Haskell hash table uh, um, 10 millions of int in pairs and you perform one lookup and time this. So um, I, um, you know, this, all the code is available online, um, but uh, I just show it here. So uh, we import uh, the, uh, um, this code is a uh, equivalent uh, of the preferred way if you want a hash table like data structure in Haskell. What you would use, you would use a, a integer map, which is a fast map for integer keys. And then what you will do, you will uh, um, define a um, map, and then you will perform a lookup. Uh, this is a hundreds key uh, that you want to look up, and you'll print it to the screen. So, so this, this is the expensive bit where you construct it, and then you'll perform one lookup. So, that's a benchmark uh, using a uh, tree data structure. And uh, the alternative hash table based solution in Haskell is as follows. You use data hash table. And uh, I did a qualified import as H. So this, here it's available, this, that particular namespace as H. And uh, I only chose to use these fellas. So um, I'm just showing this so that you can refer to it later. But it does essentially the same thing. This is a container in which you insert uh, um, key and uh, the value is the, uh, equals to the key. And then you perform one lookup of index 100. So um, I benchmark to this. Um, and uh, for, uh, I think, 10 to the power of 8, um, 10, yeah, 10 million pairs, that's the result I got on my laptop. So the, the performance is really comparable. Um, I suspect the... Um, uh, optimized version of hash tables should use less RAM, but since it's not, uh, the, the way that it's implemented, it has to use garbage collection, and uh, there was a bug in garbage collector, uh, so it, it was uh, spending 95% of it in garbage collecting, but it was fixed, and uh, that's the performance we have now, uh, int map versus hash table. So you in, if you're in Haskell land, you're much better off using maps than hash tables. The performance is very comparable, but with maps, you get persistence by default, and uh, you get uh, heavily optimized code because everybody use, uses maps in Haskell. So Python solution of this would be uh, really one liner. I just formatted it. So um, the dictionary where we put uh, uh, a bunch of key value pairs, and then we perform one lookup. So I timed it, and uh, dictionary uh, GC versus C Python. Um, it's uh, almost twice as fast in C Python for doing this task. So which is to be expected, I think, because uh, 
what we're doing. Uh, I mean, we have some interpreter overhead accessing this data structure, but underneath is really a C data structure that's invoked from Python, whereas Haskell's mm, uh, hash tables are uh, implemented in Haskell. And uh, if you want to resort to this approach where you call a C-like array from Haskell, you can do, and um, uh, Don has written uh, um, data Judy, which is a very fast mutable associative data types based on Judy arrays. Uh, if you want, you can look them up on Wikipedia. So it's a good imperative mutable replacement for int map. And in fact, uh, if you do that, so that I, I just again uh, copied uh, the enormous code um, where you import a, a Judy array as uh, J and then you use it in the same kind of pattern, perform one lookup. Um, and so that's the performance you get. Um, so it's basically essentially the same, but uh, you get uh, over a lot of hoops um, in Haskell using mutable data structure. And uh, obviously, if, uh, if it's a stateful data structure, what uh, Haskell uh, keeps this membrane between pure and impure code, because obviously, if, if all your code pure, you never have any side effects, your program prints nothing and doesn't interact with you. So uh, what they did, they created this membrane that keeps the pure code from impure, and impure does all the uh, interaction with outside world or stateful data structures. So if you choose to use uh, something like Judy arrays or hash tables, you, you will have to label explicitly all your type signatures in Haskell with I.O. And many people uh, prefer uh, immutable, uh, so they don't have to do that. So, and uh, I just uh, pulled down from somewhere. Uh, I, unfortunately, I don't have a credit, but this is a C++ solution, which I've timed. And this is uh, GC versus C++. Um, admittedly, C++ can probably be optimized a bit more, but that's the first I found. So it's, uh, you're not gaining very much by going to C++ here. So that's the end. Thank you very much. If you have any questions, uh, please ask me. Uh, <laughs> well, the uh, O'Reilly uh, pictorial representation of uh, Python is Python, and uh, Haskell is the uh, Herculean, Herculean beetle. So uh, I think someone, uh, it's not uh, actually uh, my artwork, I just replaced a camel, uh, which re represents Pearl, <laughs> who's Haskell, to end this. <laughs> but, are there any questions? I, I would only use this as a rough guide. Uh, I mean, to, to really good, really good numbers, you need to average a lot and uh, uh, probably instrument your code. And uh, these are very rough timings. So um, it depends on the uh, load of the machine at the time. And, uh, but uh, basically, we should look at these two numbers here. Any more? All right, in that case, thank you very much.